Welcome back, everyone. I'm Kalani Das, your host here, and we're talking about music mindfulness. And I want to give you a few ways that you can improve your relationship with your mind. That's key. And uh, feel more how you want to feel and just feel better. There's a lot to music mindfulness, these teachings that I've developed over the last few years. But here's some simple things you can do. Welcome back. First of all, um, we know that the musician or the way of the musician is really rooted in one key skill that is a mindfulness skill, and that skill is listening. Now, when I say listening, I don't mean exclusively listening. What I really mean is paying attention and attending to your environment, right? Listening is one of our key senses. Certainly, there are people who are deaf that, you know, we have other senses that we can use, but listening for most of us is key. We get a lot of information from listening. Listening is, since music is an auditory art form and aesthetic, listening is our gateway into music. It's our connection with music because music is sound. Music meaning comes from, of course, the relationships that are formed and that change uh, in the music itself and also our personal relationship with those sounds. So it's not only the sounds. It is, of course, a subjective experience, just like life is a subjective experience. So listening, paying attention to what's happening in your environment, that's really key. How do we do a better job of listening? What's something that you can do? Well, something very simple is to stop doing other things. It's really simple, you guys. Uh, The key to listening and the key to attending to your environment is not so much in doing something. It's not like you have to try harder to pay attention, You'll, you will automatically pay attention to whatever is in your environment. You're designed to do that. However, what stops us from doing that is, guess what? It's up here in our mind. <laughs> Distraction, right? We become distracted by our thoughts, our imaginations, rumination, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't really matter what we label it. It's mental rumination. It's distraction. It's daydreaming. It's overthinking. It's rumination. It's obsessing. It's all those things that we love to do and we can't stop, right? But we can. One of the ways that we can stop doing those things, and here's the point, is if you stop doing all those other things, if you just stop being distracted by your own thinking, you will automatically attend and hear and be aware of, see, feel, touch, taste, smell, the environment, and you will become more grounded by default, okay? So this is super huge, you guys. It's very important because this is so simple, but where do we get thrown off? How do we get confused? Well, there's a lot of teaching out there, and I would say that a lot of it is not just teaching. A lot of it is marketing, And there's a lot of people that want to tell you how to become mindful, how to, you know, become more aware. And it's not, you can't sell, you know, something that's not specific. Like you you can't just sell, well, stop distracting yourself. That's not sexy. (laughs) That's not, that's not a thing. So what do people do? They come up with, you know, um, a guidebook or some rules, right? Or some practices, you know, sit in this position, go over here, buy this app, listen to this, right? Um, Those things largely, and while they might have some value, they might be fine to do some of those things, but a lot of those things are based in a way that we not so much pay attention, but we distract ourselves more, you know? So if I go do something, if I do something, 
to help myself from uh, you know doing something else like rumination. Let's say I engage in an extreme sport or something, or even purposefully doing a meditation. And there's nothing wrong with meditating. But if I'm doing a meditation with a mantra to replace ruminative thinking, that's progress, but that's not my goal. It's not practical. It doesn't really, it's really substituting one kind of distraction for another. Now, it might be a good training intermediate step. And for a lot of people, it, it works and it moves you in the right direction. And there's nothing wrong with that. So I don't want to sound like I'm saying you shouldn't do those things. What I am saying is that those things are things. <laughs> and where we want to get is to where we're not doing something to be present. You don't have to do something to be present. It's more important to stop doing things to become present because you're designed to be present. You don't have to do it. You, you can already do it. We can all do it. We're born that way. You just have to look at infants, babies, toddlers, you know, look at the way people are designed and, or animals and you can see it. It's clear if you pay attention, if you observe. So musicians are, are trained to listen, to observe, to be in touch with things. And that's really so we can function in the world of music because the world of music is all about relationships, just like the world of the mind, the world of spirituality, our social world, everything. It's all relationships. So the question becomes, what's your relationship uh, with your mind? And therefore, what kind of relationship with the world, with, the, with your experience do you have, right? And, and therefore, can I improve that? Can I be more grounded? Can I be more present? And thereby increase uh, comfort, satisfaction, happiness, whatever that is, uh, you know, a feeling of contentment and peacefulness. All right. That's one big piece for this talk. All right. So think about that. What can you do? How are you distracting yourself? And what can you do to not do that? One thing you can do is notice that you're doing it. And if you just notice that you are ruminating, you have, you know, you're imagining things, you're worrying, you're going over past conversations, just notice it. And that'll help you stop. All right, so do that. Um, another thing that we do a lot of in music that I think really helps with mindfulness, and it's connected to mindfulness, is we are improvisers. We take what is given to us and we make something valuable out of it. And we experiment. And that's, that's fine, that's part of creativity, it's part of improvisation, it's part of composition, it's how we write, developing, working with materials. However, the key for mindfulness and the real value that comes out of, of doing that, of improvising and trying things, is that we can not only be in a flow state, right? We can be in a state of creativity, of enhanced uh, thinking, enhanced being, connected, feeling in the moment, you know, being in the moment. And we can also practice acceptance. Okay, you guys? The musician is somebody who learns to accept mistakes, we call them sometimes, uh, things that happen, our circumstances. It's a great practice to improvise music. And you realize that you can shape the music and that you will do things that are unexpected, right? That's what we call a mistake usually. Something we weren't planning on. Now, how many times has this happened to you? You've thought something was going to go a certain way, a conversation, a trip, a date, a marriage, and it doesn't quite go the way you thought. Has that ever happened to you? Uh, of course it happens. It, it happens to all of us pretty much every day. So the question then becomes, what do we do? How do we handle it? And I, my experience, and I'll, I can only talk about my experience, my experience has been that the more I practice music and the more I become an improviser and a creative thinker and somebody who can move beyond uh, mistakes, let's call them, uh, undesirable or unplanned circumstances, you know, this is not what I want to have happening, right? But, and you can observe yourself and observe those around you. What do we do when we 
find ourselves in that situation. How do we deal with it? How do we handle it? How do we process it? Do we throw a tantrum? Hopefully not. Uh, are we accepting? Do we move on quickly? Are we looking for solutions? Are we learning and adapting? All right, those are questions you have to answer for yourself, but I wanna throw that out there. I think the key is doing something artistic, some sort of artistic practice. Now, it doesn't have to be music. I think music is a great way to do that. People do it in other idioms, other uh, art forms, other practices, all right? Sports, for example, there's lots of other ways that you can do that. Um, the benefit of doing it in music, of course, is that you have something beautiful as you're practicing that, right? Something satisfying. You're learning a skill. You're engaging in an art form. You can do it in a group. You can do it by yourself. You can do it in a small room like this. You can go out in nature. There's a lot of, a lot of options there for integrating the lessons that we learn in music and we take those skills and practices and we can apply them to our life. And that's really the, what music mindfulness is about. Finally, um, I wanna leave you with the idea of befriending music. Now, when I teach, I'll sometimes recommend that people, you know, if they're learning a new instrument, for example, I say, you know what? Music is a relationship and your relationship with your instrument is the, is the doorway, right? It's the way that you're gonna access the music. In order to access music, we need to access some sort of instrument, whether it's our voice or our bodies or, or an actual instrument. That involves some technique, it involves learning, it involves what I sometimes call going on dates. Because it's an intimate relationship, you have to become friends. Meaning what? I'm curious about you, I want to get to know you, I appreciate you, there's things I can learn from you, uh, you know, and there's a give and take. Your instrument is your teacher. Why do I say that? Because anything you do, you get feedback and you learn, right? It's instant feedback. If you sit down at an instrument, even if you're not familiar with it and you start trying things, you get feedback in the form of sound, uh, sensations, things you expect, things you don't expect. The, those become like your guideposts, your signs, your, your map towards deeper understanding and hopefully more satisfaction and artistry and mastery and skill. And that, my friends, brings us back to paying attention and listening. So befriend music and in, in a similar way, Let's also bring this back to mindfulness. You have to befriend your mind. You have to understand that your mind, like an instrument, is something that you can play with. Uh, it's, it's part of you, like a, but it's like a tool. It's like another thing in your environment. Like my hand is a tool. I can do things with my hand. My mind is a tool. I can do things with my mind, but I am not my mind. I, I don't want my mind to run the show. And other people have talked about this. It's not the first time anyone's mentioned that concept. But to uh, learn how to develop a healthy and functional relationship with your mind is the key, all right? So I've said a lot of things here. There's a lot to unpack, a lot to think about. Don't think too hard. <laughs> uh, what do you guys, what do you guys think? Have you put some of these ideas to practice? If you have, if, you're, if you have tips or advice or anecdotes that you'd like to share to help our community, leave it in the comments. And if you'd like to connect with me more, you can do that at patreon.com slash Kalani for music and music mindfulness. And I'll be happy to connect with you over there. Thanks for listening, everybody. I hope this is helpful. <laughs>